our capital city of Washington, D.C., perhaps no building is more familiar than the White House, the home and office of the President of the United States. The White House is one of the most famous residences in all the world. Generations of Americans have cherished this stately mansion with its memories of presidents and great events in the history of the United States. Reminders of presidents who served in the past are all about the White House. This weeping birch tree, for example, was planted by the wife of Calvin Coolidge. And these magnolia trees by President Andrew Jackson. These famous views of the White House today, both the south entrance and the north entrance, are quite different from the White House of the past. The history of the White House began in 1790 when Congress accepted this plan by James Hoban for a president's palace. Construction was begun on October 13, 1792. First to move into the palace in 1800 were President John Adams and his wife Abigail. By the time Thomas Jefferson was president, the young nation had grown stronger and there were funds available for improvements on the president's palace. Jefferson, an amateur architect, together with a friend named Latrobe, designed certain additions to the building. An east wing and a west wing were commissioned by Congress, and the president's mansion took on the general shape by which we know it today. But the president's home, like the young United States, was not safe from attack. During the War of 1812, British forces set fire to the president's home. At that time, President James Madison and his wife Dolly were living in the president's home. When she fled approaching British forces, Mrs. Madison saved important state papers, as well as this famous portrait of George Washington, which still hangs in the White House. Flaming torches British soldiers set to the president's home marked the first and only time this building was attacked by an enemy. After the siege, only the outer walls remained of the president's home. Yet, it still stood, and so did the American nation. During the administration of James Monroe, the building was painted white to hide ugly smoke stains. Perhaps this is how the name White House came about. President Monroe, however, called his home the Executive Mansion. During the sad days of the Civil War, the Executive Mansion was the home and office of Abraham Lincoln. This room, still in use in the White House today, was once Lincoln's study. Here is his specially made bed, over eight feet long. Lincoln spent endless hours in this room, pondering the problems of the nation at war. Though Lincoln did not live to see the peace, the nation grew strong again. By the time Benjamin Harrison was sworn in as president, the prosperity of the period was evident in the ornate furnishings that filled the rooms. However, the elegance of the executive mansion was simplified by Theodore Roosevelt in 1902. He restored the rooms of the 110-year-old building to their original simple beauty. President Roosevelt felt that simple furnishings more truly represented the democratic ideals of the American people. Besides renovating the executive mansion, he gave it a new official name, the White House. Roosevelt believed that the White House should be the center of the president's family life. So, new executive offices were constructed in an enlarged west wing. Working in the new offices, Theodore Roosevelt guided the nation through a great period of growth. But gray days lay ahead for the occupants of the White House, especially for President Woodrow Wilson. This president was burdened with a greatly increased workload. For during the days of World War I, the White House became a center for the greatest war effort the nation had yet seen. For the men in the White House, the 20th century brought new problems and advances. 
President Calvin Coolidge led the nation through some of the prosperous years of the 1920s. During the following administration, that of Herbert Hoover, direct communication with the people became a part of presidential life. Millions of American citizens heard President Hoover by means of radio. During Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration, radio communication was installed inside the White House. Later, beginning with President Truman, activities in the White House have been televised to the people. Press conferences are another means of communication. President Eisenhower made extensive use of conferences with reporters to acquaint the people with news from the White House. In 1949, the White House itself made news. At the request of President Truman, renovation of the White House was ordered by the Congress. The restoration took two and a half years and was completed in 1952. In some ways, it is a far different building from the one John Adams moved into in 1800. For example, the greatly expanded West Wing would probably have surprised and impressed earlier presidents. Inside the West Wing of the White House is the room where the president confers with the members of his cabinet. Flanked by the American flag and the flag with the seal of his office is the chair of the president. This is the president's own private office where he may meet with his many advisors. Here at the president's desk are made many of the day-by-day -day decisions that shape the work of the executive branch of our government. The main entrance to the White House proper is the impressive North Entrance. Distinguished visitors entering from the North are ushered into this spacious lobby. Once inside, we see set into the marble floor of the lobby Four dates important in the history of the White House. 1792, construction. 1817, repair after war damage. 1902, first remodeling. 1952, latest remodeling. Above these doors, at the far end of the lobby, is the great seal of the President of the United States. doors open into the famous Blue Room, noted for its oval shape. Much of the official social life of the president takes place in the Blue Room. Here, the president and the first lady meet guests at state receptions and greet foreign diplomats. Leading from either side of the Blue Room are other rooms for social functions. On one side is the green room. On the other side is the red room. The red room and the green room, which are similar, are also used for formal occasions. The red room, another reception room, is used by the president and his family for state functions only. From the red room, guests may be taken into the huge state dining room. Formal and diplomatic dinners are held here. This great dining hall can comfortably seat more than a hundred people. Here too are memories of great presidents. For example, these magnificent gold candelabras which decorate the great table were used by James Monroe. The huge chandelier dating from the administration of Theodore Roosevelt is solid silver. Representative pieces of dinnerware once used on this table by former presidents are preserved in the China Room. Here are reminders of the presidents and their families who previously lived in the White House. This plate and tureen were part of a set used by John Adams. This service was used by James Polk while this place setting was used by the family of Abraham Lincoln. And this by Dwight D. Eisenhower.
Also in the China Room is a portrait of Mrs. Calvin Coolidge, one of the most gracious hostesses ever to live in the White House. Other portraits of the wives of the presidents decorate the Oval Room, also called the Diplomatic Reception Room. Yes, throughout all the rooms of the White House, there are memories of the people who lived here. The presidents who guided our nation through its proud history. In the green room, we are reminded not only of many historic evenings during which the president is host, but also of the official responsibilities of the president, as symbolized by the great seal woven into the rug of the green room. But perhaps the room most crowded with the memories of presidents lies at the end of this beautiful corridor, the East Room. In this magnificent room, President Lincoln's body lay in state. Alice Roosevelt's wedding reception was held, and many inaugural parties took place. The room is dominated by symbols of the American nation. The famous portrait of George Washington, which was saved by Dolly Madison in 1814. And a companion portrait of Martha Washington. The grand piano, first used during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is decorated with scenes of American folk dances. Reminders of the American heritage can be found in all the rooms in the White House. As President Theodore Roosevelt once said, it is good to preserve such buildings as historic monuments which keep alive our sense of continuity with the nation's past. And the words of another president, John Adams, are in the state dining room. I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and on all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. To that prayer for the presidents and their home, we, the citizens of the United States of America, will fervently add our own.